We started a series last week on gaining confidence and confidence being a, a feeling of trust in someone or something or confidence is that expectation or, or a favorable expectation that something good's gonna happen. It's confidence. We talked about how important confidence is and the confidence is needed. This morning, I wanna talk about some areas of confidence. I wanna talk about the, the boosters of confidence and some of the busters of confidence. And uh, we're, we're gonna stay along the same line. We're still gonna look at, at the, the life of a very famous Bible character, but confidence is often based on a lot of belief. In other words, they're really hard to, con to, to separate those two. Belief, what you believe. You know, what you believe, right or wrong, is going to have an impact on you. There was a family in the, in the, in the 1940s, most of America still lived in rural parts uh, of America. They didn't live in the big cities, but the big cities were beginning to blossom and bloom. And a family from the hills of North Carolina decided that they were going to go down to the big city for the very first time. They had been very isolated. And they were amazed. They were looking at all the skyscrapers and looking at, at the, at, to them, the skyscrapers, you know, six or seven stories was a skyscraper. And they were looking at the shops and the crowds and the cars. It was just almost an overwhelming experience. But the mother and the daughter decided to go off and go shopping and the father and son were just walking around and they walked in the tallest building in the whole city. It was a bank and that was the days when, if you remember banks used to have these beautiful lobbies marble lobbies and they were just amazed, big tall ceilings. But what really caught their attention was these doors, these silver doors that opened and shut on their own. They'd never seen an elevator before. And they walked over and they stood in front of it and they watched the doors open and the doors shut. And as they were standing there, a little lady came. She must have been pushing 90. Life had been hard on her. She was bent over. She looked kind of rough, but she, she walked in there with her cane and she turned around and and before the door shut, she smiled at the, the father and his son, and they smiled back. They watched the lights go up. They watched the lights come down. The doors opened again, and there was a beautiful 25-year-old woman standing there <laughs> who, who walked, smiled at them and walked past them. The father never took his eyes off the doors. He reached out and he grabbed his son. He said, boy, go get your mama. What you believe will impact you. Of course, he's in for a rude awakening. I think it was Henry Ford that said, whether you believe, whether you, believe you can or you can't, you're right. And so what we believe is important. What, you, what we believe our belief is based a lot of times on our capacity to do something. If someone came in here after service and said, hey, my car is, is not working. There are some of you in here right now who have the belief and the capacity that you could go out there and find out what the problem is and fix it. Or some of you, when things break around your home, and I'm gonna put male and female in this category, there's some of you, when things break around your home, you don't call anybody. You're like, I take this on. I can fix this. It's not that way in our home. <laughs> things break down in my home, Joy tells me. And she's like, I'm like, why are you telling me? Are you telling me before you call someone or you've already called somebody to come and fix it? If, unless, it's a, unless it's a clogged up toilet. I have a gift with clogged up toilets. <laughs> It's a, it's a skill, it's, a, it's, it's amazing, but it stops right there. I don't have that capacity, but people who have that capacity, who can do stuff like that, man, they take on a challenge. You know, relational, there's relational confidence. You know, Jordan and I have been married, we're going to be 42 years next April. And we've been, it's good. To each other. And um, <laughs> we, we noticed that when when we first got married, that our, our marriage was tough. And uh, we, had some, we had a lot of rough times and there wasn't a lot of confidence there. And we would argue frequently. And, and when we argued, it really, it really shook Joy because she, she kept thinking, this marriage is not gonna make it. Well, thank God the Lord helped us. You know, if your marriage is hurting right now, I got good news for you, the Lord can help you. And she, and our, but she got so much better. It was, it was so, it was so. <laughs> no, what happened, what happened was as our, as our, as the Lord worked on both of us, our relationship grew. And as our relationship grew, we have a lot of belief, a lot of confidence in that relationship now. If you walked up to me and said, you know, I, I'd watch Joy because, you know, I, you know, word on the street is she, she's partying when you're not around. I, I would laugh in your face. It's like, oh, you have you got to be kidding. I know her. She knows me. There's a confidence there. And you say, well, is your marriage perfect? No, it's, there is no, by the way, there is no perfect marriage. There is not. 
There are good ones, there are strong ones, there's no perfect ones. Ours is not perfect, but we've learned this. When we get sideways, we don't stay that way. And we bounce back, and our bounce back has become quicker. Thank God, God can help you in that area, and you can actually have relational confidence, but then we can also have a confidence with God. And it's a confidence based on our beliefs. What do you believe about him? Do you believe that he's good, or do you believe he doesn't care? Is your God powerful, or is he just kind of wimpy? Is your God the character of your God? Is it good? Is it gracious? What do you believe about God? Because that's going to impact how you interact with him. What do you believe about what he's done in you? We say, well, you know, Alan, I, I know I just get to go to heaven when I die, and that's it. No, well, and that's good. Believe me, that's good. Eternity is a long, long time. But he's done so much more. And if you believe that he's not only done a work for you, that he's done a work in you, then boy, that's powerful. And then what do you believe about your relationship with him? Do you believe that he will hear you when you pray? Do you believe that he'll, he would help you if you needed help? See, that's, those, are, those are key things. Now listen, if you're, if you're answering those questions with no, 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 thank God that can change. Because wherever you are in your confidence level with God, you can gain in your confidence. This is not like a fixed asset. This is not like your height. This is not like something that's just like, well, I'm, I'm never going to be any taller than this. or I'll, I'll never have any more confidence in God than this. Listen, you can have more confidence in God. Now, it's not up to him. It's up to you. I love the story. And we're, as we're getting into the Christmas season, I'm sure we're going to talk about it sometime, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, when, when the angel approached her and told her she was going to have a baby and she didn't know how, and he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you and, and it's going to be a, a holy one's going to be the, the child of God. You know, Mary didn't look at him and go, I don't know about that. Mary said, fine, let it be to me according to your word. And, and a little bit later, her, her cousin Elizabeth said this to her. She said, blessed, you are blessed because you believe the Lord would do what he said. You're blessed when you believe that the Lord would do. You're blessed when you simply begin to believe that he's good. You're blessed when you begin to believe he's done something good in you. You're blessed when you begin to believe that you can actually have a relationship with him, that you can pray that he can hear you as quickly as he can hear me Amen. or as quickly as he even could hear joy. Because that's a, that's a belief based on what he's done. Bruce Wilkinson is an author that said he was in Africa a number of years ago back when uh, Swaziland, I think they've changed the name of it now, but Swaziland, they were in Africa, southern part of Africa. They were planting gardens all around uh, that southern part of Africa. And on the last day, they came upon a series of mud huts. And there was a lady in the mud hut who had by herself taken on the care of 56 orphans. By herself. And all around her mud huts, there were gardens that were dug up, but nothing was growing. And uh, they asked the lady, they said, ma'am, why do you have nothing growing in your garden? She said, well, she said, last night I prayed. She said, and I asked God to send someone to plant gardens for us. And so this morning I told the kids, dig up the ground, let's get ready. And sure enough, they were able to plant and give her some beautiful gardens, but she got ready ahead of time. That's confidence in God. Yeah. Dig up the ground, dig it up, let's go. We're gonna have, we're gonna have some gardens, and they had gardens all around there. That's confidence. We've been talking about uh, Samson. We talked about him last week. Actually, we talked about his parents and Samson's supernatural birth. Remember, his parents couldn't have any children. Angel appeared to him, told him they were gonna have kids. To actually told him he was going to have a boy. He's going to be a Nazarite, which means he was going to be separated to God. Just told him some great things. And Samson was born. And Samson, there's a, a phrase that you'll see that the Spirit of the Lord began to move on Samson. Samson was called to be a deliverer of Israel. They were being oppressed by the Philistines. Philistines were attacking them, were all over them. And Samson was, was called to be the one that was going to help set Israel free. So as he grew up, he began, to, man, he became a one-man wrecking ball with the Philistines. He killed their men. He burned their crops. He burned their olive groves. He burned their vineyards. He, and then he killed more of them. And he was just wrecking havoc. And they actually came to arrest him. And a whole Philistine army came, or a bunch of them came, and they camped out in Judah. And the men of Judah said, what do you guys, why are y'all coming after us? He said, we're not coming for you. He said, we're coming for Samson. 
Samson's the one who's been hurting us and we're, we're going to come for him. And the guys of Judah said, well, let's don't fight. We'll get him for you. And they went to Samson and said, Samson, I don't know what you're doing, bro, but these people are, they rule over us and you're causing us problems. So we're, we're going to see the story here. They said to him, we've come down to arrest you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him saying, no, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the spirit of the Lord. Now you're going to see that. You will see that phrase used in Samson's life. Then the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire and his bonds broke loose from his hands and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Now Samson had some confidence. He had some confidence in who his power source was. Samson, when, when they came to arrest Samson, I mean a whole bunch of men came to arrest him and he's like, okay, as long as you guys don't kill me yourself. And it's like, you know, if you came to arrest me, I've been, I've been thinking, no, wait, whoa, 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 y'all, y'all are my brothers. I'm trying to help you out. What are you doing? He's like, no, no, you go, go ahead. He said, just don't kill me yourself. And then they took him down. They took him down. He's got ropes on his, he got ropes on his arms. They, go, they take him down to the Philistines. The Philistines see him. They're like, oh, we got him now. And they're shouting. They're rushing on him. He said those, and the spirit of God came on him. See, he knew who his power source was. When you see the, the life of Samson, and I'm, I'm going to throw this out, Samson could not have been a big man. Now, I know Hollywood portrays Samson as huge. But if Samson was so big, why did they keep trying to find out the secret of his strength? He wasn't a big guy. The average men about that time was about 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, if Samson had been 6'8", 300 pounds with 10% body fat, no one would have wondered where his great strength was. You just looked at him and said, he's a monster. I mean, if he looked like a bodybuilder, then no one would have wondered, hey, where's his strength? No, his strength was actually in the fact that the Spirit of God would come on him. And when the Spirit of God would come on him, it enabled him to pick up a jawbone of a donkey and wipe out a thousand men. Who say, well, I don't believe that. Listen, the same God who created planets and the universe can anoint you to kill a thousand people with it. It's still, we sing same God, he's still the same God. And he's still, <laughs> I think sometimes we sell God way, way, way too short. So he killed a thousand men. He knew who his power source was. He believed in that. He, he, Samson believed he was special. Now, I bet Samson grew up all his life thinking he was special. You know, we had those little children down here this morning. I bet their parents tell them that they're special. Did your parents, I hope your parents told you. I hope you tell your kids. Oh, you're, 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 they, I'm sure they told him. Oh, honey, we couldn't have any children. And an angel appeared to us. And an angel said we were going to have you. And you, you, you're special. You had a supernatural birth, Samson. And Samson, God said that you're going to grow up. You're going to be a Nazarite from, from your mom, just from the womb. No, no razor is ever going to come on his head. So Samson knew that a Nazarite was someone who was dedicated to God and he was dedicated to God from his birth. And no razor came on his head. I'm sure he, he, he ran in one day, Mama, Mama, why, why is my hair so long? I said, well, honey, you're, you're, you are special and God has, has called you and you're going to deliver Israel. And so his hair became, his hair wasn't his strength. His hair represented his connection to God. Growing your hair long will not make you stronger. Your connection to God is what makes you stronger. And so his, his connection was there. He knew he, was, he knew he was special. And he also knew that if he ever severed that connection, that his strength would be like anybody else's. He knew his power source. He knew he was special. And Samson, though, did not place enough value on his connection with God, his relationship with God. He didn't value it. Now, Samson had a problem with women. He was a ladies' man. Samson liked, he liked all kinds, he never married. But he meant he got involved with, with prostitutes in, in Gaza. And there was a Gaza then. He wasn't good then either. And so he got involved in <laughs> prostitutes in Gaza. He got involved with a woman named Delilah. Delilah, boy, 
that's not a good, by the way, I'm, I'm, we've never had a Delilah up here that we've had to dedicate. And I'm really glad she, she was not a good woman. She was not a good woman, but he loved her. And, and when, when the Philistines realized he was dating Delilah, then they came to, Don, they came to her and said, look, um, sweetheart, here's the deal. If you can find out where his great strength is, again, why would you need to find it out if he was a monster? He said, if you can find out the secret of his strength so we can beat this guy, we're going to give you some money. In fact, all of us are going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver each. We don't know how many of the Philistine rulers there were, but 1,100 pieces of silver weighed out at about 28 pounds. She wasn't a gold digger. She was a silver digger ahead of time. And she began to talk to Samson and she began to press Samson about, about where his strength was. And she's like, baby, tell me, tell me where your strength is and what's going to, what it's going to take. Three times she did this. One time he said, a bow strings, if you tie me with bow strings, I'll, I'll, I'll be strong. One, if you tie me with new rope. Another one, if you weave the locks of my hair. And he kept messing with her. But every time he told her something, he got attacked by the Philistines. You would think this brother would figure out this woman is bad news. Every time I tell you something, darling, I just get attacked by Philistines. In fact, the Philistines were in her house. But he didn't get it. So she wore him down. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Whew. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass, look at this, thing, when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Look straight ahead. Don't look at anybody around. <laughs> and he told her all his heart and said to her, no razors ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite, separated to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. She lulled him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him <laughs> again, and strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He woke from his sleep and said, I'll go out as before and and at other times and shake myself free, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. She, he didn't recognize the enemy and he didn't recognize the end game here. He kept, he kept messing around with this girl. And he kept getting closer and closer to the problem. Finally, it says she pestered and pressed him. He say, well, well that, see, it was her fault. Uh -uh. He could have he walked, he could have kicked that girl to the curb anytime. He didn't do it. And so he finally told her what was in his heart. And when that connection, when his connection was, was severed, there went his strength. Now next week, this story does have a good, well, a kind of a good ending, a redemptive ending. And we'll talk about that next week. But they captured him, put his eyes out, changed his whole life. Because he didn't recognize that the enemy was trying to do everything he could to sever that connection. That's a buster. So let's talk a little bit about in the last few minutes about things that can that boost our, our confidence, things that can bust them. Here's the first one. You gotta, you gotta believe in your power source, our spiritual source of power. Second Timothy 1.7 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Paul was writing to Timothy. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Holy Spirit may be the most underestimated part of the Godhead, the one we don't talk about enough, the one we don't realize is God has not given us the same, listen, the same spirit that was on Samson is living in us. And you say, well, oh boy, that's, that's amazing. No, listen, the Bible said, if you think that's good, it's the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of us. You say, well, you know, just because well, I don't see him and I don't feel him and I've, I've never seen him be. Listen, how many of you realize that just because you don't see it and feel it does not mean it does not exist? We live in a realm where there's a whole lot of things. I was reading something the other day. I didn't even realize there was this branch of science. It's called bioacoustics. And they got these, they got these instruments that said what we don't realize is they said all of creation is making noise. They said a metal lark, bird has 300 notes it could sing, a range of 300 notes. A whale, the songs of whales can travel underwater for thousands of miles. 
It's saying that even, and this one blew me away, even earthworms make noise. They make little staccato noises. He said they make noise. In fact, one man said, he said that in, the, in a, an hydrogen atom has a hundred frequencies, which is more than a grand piano that has 88 frequencies. And we realized that, well, just because we haven't heard it doesn't mean it's not existing. They said if we could hear all the sounds that are around us from the flies to the birds to the creation, listen, all creation is singing. They're all making noise. But just because we haven't heard it doesn't mean it's not real. And just because you haven't seen the Holy Spirit does not mean he's not real and not living in you. And because he's living in you, say, well, how does he become more real? But begin to acknowledge him and his power in your life. Begin to acknowledge him. Thank you, Lord, that you have given me the Holy Spirit to live in me. Here's the second thing. Here's a booster. You have to believe that you are special. Believe what God's done for you. Believe what God's done in us, that you're special. You say, well, not special like special. No, special like good special. Special like what first Peter talked about when Peter was, was writing to the church. He said, for you are a chosen generation. He's talking to us. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. He said, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That means we've got a supernatural birth. We have a supernatural calling. God has, we are separated. If Listen, if you live separated to God, it's even stronger than being a Nazarite because you are one in your heart and God's got a calling on your life that is absolutely special. You can thank God, say, God, thank you. You have done something really, really good in me. You're special. Before you go to bed tonight, look at yourself in the mirror and go, you are special. <laughs> Holy nation, chosen people, called of God. Here's the last one. And this is key. This is, this is the buster. We've got to place great value on our relationship and connection to the Lord. We have to place value there. Guys, listen, we live in a day, just, just like Samson it was Delilah, but the Delilah, you could look at Delilah like a type of the enemy who was pestering him and pressing him. And we live in a world where there are spiritual forces lined up against us and they are pressing us and they are pestering us and it's daily. And the whole idea is to sever that connection between you and God. You say, well, you mean sever the connection so that I'm lost? No, sever that relationship. See, with Samson, it was related to his hair. With us, it's related to our heart and our heart connection with the Lord. We don't, we don't want our heart connection with the Lord to, to be severed. We want to walk in, in fellowship with him. The apostle John wrote something and it's a fascinating verse. It talks about confidence and it says this, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Have you ever done something wrong? I will, don't answer that. All of us, all of us have. And when we miss it, when we sin and miss it, you don't have to ask anyone, did I sin and miss it? You know on the inside you missed it. And you don't have confidence with God. I can remember I was part of a, I went to high school and they, had, they used to have those uh, intercoms in the room. I don't know if they have intercoms anymore. But there were these intercoms, and this is in, right before, after the dark ages ended. And this was... Um, <laughs> an intercom, but we'd be sitting there and you would hear, Mrs. Miller, and she'd go, yes. Is, is Alan Clayton in there? Yes, he is. Would you send him to the office, please? And everyone will go, oh. <laughs> now, if I had done nothing wrong, I'd just march on down to the office like, something good is gonna happen to me. But if I had messed up, that's not where I wanted to go, because when I went to school, Back in the dark ages, all the assistant principals had paddles. Can I get a witness to anybody? <laughs> and I feared two things. I feared getting paddled by the assistant principal, but even more, I feared telling my parents I got in trouble at school. Because if I did that, it was worse at home. So whatever, it was called taking licks. You get four licks and they weren't this kind of licks either. They were, <laughs> but if I hadn't done anything wrong, I had confidence. Listen, listen, when we sin, when we miss it is when we lose confidence with God. 
This is, you say, well, what am I supposed to do? Here's the thing. Treat other people right. Let's walk in love. That's Jesus' commandment. And then walk in the light of what you know to do. When you walk in the light of what you know, you say, well, I just came into this. Listen, just walk in the light of what you know to do. And as we grow with him, we want, that, we want this relationship to be good. And so if you missed it, you say, well, say, well Alan, I missed, it. I missed it so many times. Thank God if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Don't avoid God when you mess it. Go to him. Because it's not like he finds out about it when you tell him. <laughs> you tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry, I missed it. He doesn't go, oh. he knows. And he's right there to go, and I forgive you. And you can receive forgiveness. Because here's the deal. The stronger our connection is, the stronger our confidence is down here. Samson said, if I lose that connection with God, he said, I'll be like any other man. And if and it should, I'll be as weak as any other man. I'm going to tell you something. But with our, with our confidence, with our connection strong with the Lord, we are stronger than our enemies. Pastor John Osteen, as I close with this, Pastor John Osteen. And by the way, when I close, just give me two seconds after, after we close. John Osteen was my pastor for a number of years. And he talked about a friend of his that he knew that was going through just a difficult time. It seemed like the enemy was just attacking him left and right and left and right. And when his, he was just so pressured and he had a, he went to he went to sleep one night and he had a dream he said in this dream he was walking through this desolate area it was dark it was it was barren just looked like the backside of the wilderness he said as he was walking through this area he looked up and in the distance he saw someone coming towards him he said what was coming toward him he said it looked like a man but he got closer and closer he realized it was Satan himself. And he began to tremble. And Satan continued to come closer to him. He said, but in his dream, all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to him. And Jesus looked at him. And then Jesus turned and faced Satan. And then in the dream, he backed up. And he backed up into the body of this man. And as Satan got close, he said, the man raised his hand and said, in the name of Jesus, bow your knee. And he did. See, we're not strong in ourselves, but in him, we are stronger than our enemies and stronger than the enemies that come against us. This is why this connection is so important. Will you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for your strength. We thank you that wherever we are in our confidence level, we can gain, we can grow, we can come closer to you. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for the fellowship, the connection that we have in our hearts with you. What a blessing that is. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you came this morning and said, you know, Alan, I don't have a relationship with the Lord or I'm not sure, or maybe you said, I used to have one uh, and I've gotten away from him. We're going to say a prayer. This online, this is for you. If you're, if you're watching sometime later, this is still for you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to say a prayer. I'm not going to have you stand up or come to the front. But if that's you that I'm talking to and you say, Alan, that's me. I, I don't have a relationship with the Lord or I'm not sure I do or I want to come back to him. Would you pray for me? Quick, just slip up your hand real quick and say, that's me. Would you pray for me? Thank you. Appreciate your, appreciate your courage. Anybody else say, Alan, that's me. Would you pray for me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to say a prayer. If you didn't lift your hand, but you really wanted to, obviously I can't see you online. Pray this prayer with us. We'll pray it out loud together. You pray it from your heart. We're going to join you as a church family. Say, dear God, I know mankind needs a savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Father, thank you for those who prayed that prayer. Thank you, Father, for those who've come out of darkness into the spiritual light. And for those who've come back home, we rejoice with them. We're grateful for all you've done and all you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give me two more minutes and we'll be out. Two more minutes. 
One, if you prayed that prayer with us, there's a, if you're in here, there's a card by your seat. If you take it and fill it out, we'll pray for you every week or you can scan that. We'll pray for you. We do it every week because we recognize the value of that decision. So take a moment and do that. And then we've got something coming up very special. It is our Christmas outreach offering. Now we're going to do a lot of outreach next week, but we do outreaches from before Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas. We're going to do Atari Drive uh, groceries, first responders outreach, Operation Christmas Child. We've got nursing homes on the list. We're going to do a lot of good things. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, cost is 50000 I, I, We've still got, we don't have the whole 50 left to go. I think we have about 39 left to go. I believe we can hit that. I believe we can go past it. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you can text Christmas. Uh, if you want to give the whole amount, like I said, we, we will not stop you at all. And, uh, but this is something that we get a chance to bless our community. So you can do that. You can offering envelopes, like I said, give online. You can drop them in the back. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We love you guys. We're praying for you. Have a great week. God bless. 